Okay, good morning. Good to see you all. Hope you all had a good night's rest and feel fresh this morning. How about all of you this morning? Good, Pastor. Good, okay. Okay, thank you for joining class. Um, today we're going to look at uh, the last chapter in First Timothy and then we'll move on to um, Second Timothy, okay. Uh, last week we saw, uh, we looked at chapter 4 and chapter 5. Can anyone tell me what we studied in chapter 4 and chapter 5, please? Any idea what we studied in chapter 4? Okay, so basically in chapter 4, yes, uh, we saw about, uh, yeah, believers' responsibility, leadership, that's chapter 5, chapter 4. He talks about false teachers and then he talks about how, uh, you know, Timothy needs to set an example uh, in conduct, in love, in, in spirit, in faith and in purity. First Timothy chapter 4 um, was 12. And then uh, he tells Timothy not to neglect the gifts that uh, has been given to him. Uh, and then he tells him to take heed uh, for himself, uh, uh, his way of life, the doctrine that he's uh, uh, teaching. And then in chapter 4, like you all said, uh, talks about, uh, you know, um, relationship within the church, relationship within the family, responsibilities, the believer's responsibility towards their own family, uh, the church's responsibility towards uh, widows. Uh, yes, he talks. Thank you, Arun. He also talks about leadership. Even Kiran has mentioned about that leadership. Thank you. He's talking about uh, how as uh, Timothy as a leader uh, should be a spiritual leader and how he should lead others. Uh, and then he gives some personal notes on spiritual leadership. Okay. So that is chapter... <clears throat> Five, okay, and uh, you know the key takeaway was is verse seventeen where the, he says you know we need to honor everybody in the church, uh, we need to honor fathers, mothers, uh, uh, young people, young women, uh, widows, and also he says that uh, those who are elders in the church, those who have a spiritual responsibility, especially those who uh, teach and preach the word and doctrine. They are, um, you know, uh, worthy of double honor. So the key takeaway was was uh, was um, seventeen of chapter five. Now we'll move on to chapter six. So I request all of you to please uh, uh, turn to your Bibles to First Timothy chapter six, so that you can follow through. Uh, also, if you can have your uh, notes opened, uh, you know, I'm, I'll be giving a lot of extra notes so you can take it down. Um, so hence, you can follow in your notes and also uh, write down anything extra you want to write. And um, also keep your Bibles open so that we can read from that. Okay, you can read uh, each verse or the section which I ask you to read. Uh, so for our study today, we're going to divide this, um, uh, this chapter, chapter 6, which is the last chapter in 1 Timothy. Uh, we'll divide it into six sections. Uh, so in verses 1 and 2, um, you know, Paul is addressing uh, workplace relationships, how believers should be in the workplace. In verses uh, 3 to 5, he's, uh, uh, you know, giving words of truth. Uh, Verses 6 to 10, 10, he's talking about godliness with contentment, how it's important to, uh, you know, be godly and to be content. In verses 11 to 16, he's talking about the life of man, uh, of a man of God. Okay, how a man of God, how a leader, a spiritual leader, or how a believer, one who has faith in God, how they should live their lives. Verses 17 to 19, he's talking about the responsibilities of the rich. 
and verses 20 to 21, he's, uh, he's uh, admonishing Timothy, uh, encouraging him how to guard what has been entrusted to him. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy, but there are a lot of lessons that we can learn because it's talking about the church, it's talking about leadership, it's talking about believers, it's talking about our responsibility. Um, towards our own family, towards uh, people in the church, uh, towards, you know, even if you're in the workplace, how we need to, um, uh, you know, how we need to behave, how uh, we need to act, our relationships. So it's not something that is just written to Timothy, so we have to study, but something that we can apply to our own lives here and now in the present, okay? So we look at verses 1 and 2, uh, the first section, uh, workplace relationships. So can somebody read verses 1 and 2, please? Those who are slaves must consider their master worthy of all respect, so that no one will speak evil of the name of God and of our teaching. Slaves belonging to Christian must, master must not despise them, for they are their brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better, because those who benefit from their work are believers whom they love. You must teach and preach these things. Thank you, Erin. So here we see that Paul um, is uh, talking about uh, how believers should be at the workplace and their relationships at the workplace. And so he's talking about uh, bond servants, basically referring in, in our present day and time, uh, employees. Okay, so all of us are employees, whether we're working in the secular or even in, the, in ministry. Okay, so as employees, we are to honor or we are to respect our employers. Our employers are those who are over us, who God has placed over us, our bosses, our supervisors. So we need to uh, honor them. We need to respect them. And Paul is saying, why should we honor them? Why should we respect them? So that the name of the Lord is glorified and it's not dishonored. And hence, it's so important uh, how we conduct ourselves in our workplace, how we conduct ourselves in ministry, how we conduct ourselves in church, and how we live our lives is so important because whatever we do, say, and the way we behave and act, you know, it's either going to glorify God or it's going to bring dishonor to his name. Now, if you notice in the previous chapters, uh, Paul is talking about honoring people. OK, uh, honoring different people in the church. So he's saying you have to honor everybody in the church. And he first he talks about fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, uh, widows. Um, and uh, he then goes on to talk about, uh, you know, giving double honor to those who are elders, especially those who teach. And here he's talking about honoring how employees have to honor. Uh, uh, you know, uh, honor their employers or how servants have to uh, honor their masters, okay? Now, at the workplace, uh, when we respect, now in the workplace, when I say it's not talking about the secular field only, if you're even in your ministry, okay? So at the workplace, we respect and honor those who God has placed above us uh, because when we do, we are actually doing what God wants us to do or what God expects of us to do, okay? Uh, which means, you know, we should not be bad-mouthing about them, criticizing behind their back, uh, you know, uh, uh, tearing them down, their character behind their backs, um, you know, doing things that will disrupt their plans, their agendas, uh, doing things that are contrary to what they are saying, they are wanting, they are planning. But, you know, we need to, uh, yes, we work with human beings. None of them are perfect. Everyone have their weaknesses. Um, so instead of going and sharing with, with others and talking about other, uh, our, our bosses and uh, pastors and leaders whom God has placed about us, you know, even if, you know, we might sound very spiritual when we say, you know, I'm just sharing it with you so that you can pray about it, okay? Uh, but if you really have to pray about it, you can pray about it because God is going to hear your prayer. He's going to answer. And it's important that you speak it out with the person directly and not bad mouth about them, criticize, do things behind their back. Uh, because when we do all of these things, it's not going to benefit anyone. It's not going to benefit your uh, employer, uh, uh, your uh, boss. Uh, it's going to create a lot of confusion, uh, a, a lot of strife, um, 
to the end that it'll bring disunity and division. So that's not what God wants us to do, and that's not what He expects us of expects of us. Um, and so it's important that you know uh, we are very careful in how we live our lives and how we honor and respect our uh, uh, employers whom God has placed over us. So what and how we work uh, itself is a testimony uh, to God and it's also an opportunity for us to glorify God in the workplace because when people see us uh, and the way we work, the way we honor, the way we respect, uh, the way we keep time, discipline, um, the way we act, um, you know, it's going to bring glory and honor to uh, the God we serve, the God we uh, worship. Now, a good example about this is uh, Joseph and Daniel as well. You know, they try to find some fault uh, in Daniel's work, but he was so... Uh, excellent, you know, he had an excellent spirit. He did, he did, he was, he never manipulated things. He kept record of things. There could, no way they could find any way, you know, where he would, a fault or a mistake. He was so perfect in what he um, did. And that is uh, the God we serve, a God of perfection, a God who does everything perfect in order, a God who is one God uh, in three persons, but each one of them work in perfect unity and in oneness. And we see that it is uh, their desire that each one of us also work in unity and in oneness, because it's in John chapter 17, uh, in the high priestly prayer, uh, uh, where Jesus says, Father, let them be one as we are one. So God desires unity and oneness. And sometimes, you know, it's it's okay for us to drop down our egos, uh, even to the point where, uh, you know, uh, 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 even to the point where it's okay if we have to lose things in life, uh, lose our privileges, uh, honor, but if, uh, you know, we're saying, God, I'm just doing this so that there's unity maintained you know this person is trying to do this in my team not trying to work for me trying to work against me trying to bring everyone against me god you see it you know it i'm not going to talk about it to anybody you are going to handle that you know uh, when we do that uh, it this is god's work this is god's ministry god's vineyard you know uh, god is for us if god is for us who can be against us you know and god will move for you. He will work things. He will either remove that person or he will give you so much of favor in, in front of people that people will be able to see through, understand what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, God will just fight your battles. You don't fight for God. God will fight your battles. All you need to do is continue to love that person, continue to maintain unity, continue to keep steady in what you are doing. Uh, you don't try to talk about this person to that person, create more division, create more disruption, because that is going to cause even more confusion. Okay, so personally, in my own journey uh, in the ministry, uh, it's not been easy handling teams. You know, I've seen people who come against me, do things, but I have never tried to fight them because I have no time fighting them. I have no energy fighting them. Uh, I just leave it to God. Say, God, you see, you know, I don't even have time to hear what, you know, uh, people are saying. I have no proof. But God, you see everything, you will work, you will fight my battle. And I've seen God fight my battles for me. Okay. All we need to do is continue to, you know, keep that unity going in the team, uh, keep God's work going, progressing. Don't deviate into all of these things that the enemy brings in so that it will drain you of your time, energy. And finally, it just, you know, breaks everything or brings down everything that you're trying to build up you just continue building like nehemiah there are a lot of people who are trying to you know cause uh, confusion try to bring him out from his work so that they can prove him uh, uh, and show him wrong that he's made a mistake but we see that nehemiah never left his post he never left his position he was at his workplace 
always, even if they called him to come to the temple or called him to come and we'll discuss about this and that, he never went. Uh, he stayed positioned. He did what he came to do and he fulfilled it. And that is what we need to do. Okay, Don't deviate into a lot of other things, but keep your focus um, right. And God will fight our battles. He will take care like Nehemiah. Sorry, for Nehemiah, God fought the battles. Okay, uh, he didn't have to do anything. They just stayed positioned uh, and God fought the battle for them, just like he did for the rest of the battles for the uh, Israelites. Okay, so uh, when we honor God in our workplace, in the way we live and the way we honor our bosses, the way we work, God is glorified and also people are watching us. Okay, uh, non-believers, um, for them, ours we, our lives, are the only Bible that they are able to read uh, in the world. Okay, they would never read a Bible, but they would they'll be reading our lives. So your life is going to, you know, be the first touch point uh, through which they are able to know God, you know, know about Jesus or know about the Christian faith. But if our life is such you know, that it uh, turns them away or it's disgusting in their sight or they're quite irritated with the way we live, the way we do things, then even if they, you know, somebody is bringing the gospel, they'll have nothing to do because they say, I know a Christian, he or she worked with me in the workplace and what your Bible is saying and their lives is totally different and contrary. I don't want anything to do with the Bible. Okay. So, um, it's very important how we portray ourselves in this world. Uh, if we don't, then then we become a hindrance or a stumbling block for them to come to the uh, faith. So our lives are the open Bible or the only Bible that they are going to read and they're going to uh, see. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, watch your life and your conduct and how you live your um, lives so that the name of God and his doctrine are not blasphemed. That's what Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, you know, people will judge Christianity, who God is, the name of God, what the Bible teaches, that is talking about the doctrines uh, based on how believers uh, conduct themselves in the workplace or how believers conduct themselves as workers. So we should not give an opportunity for people to blame God or blame the church uh, for the wrong uh, the, for the wrong behavior of Christians at the workplace okay and Paul also goes on to say when you have a believer boss it's very easy for us to think okay he's a believer boss and uh, or now he's become a Christian so you know he will give me more uh, 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 favor above all the other employees uh, and since he's a believer he's my brother in Christ uh, he should not expect me to work very hard uh, well that is a wrong kind of uh, thinking um, also we cannot expect them to think that you know okay my boss is a believer so he'll understand that uh, I was not able to complete this work because I went for fasting prayer or went for the special meeting the special man of God came and we had this meeting and so you know I know today was a deadline but I couldn't finish it because uh, uh, you know I had to go for this prayer meeting or uh, I had to uh, attend this bible study um, well He's a believer boss, but Paul is saying, you know, um, just like for the elders in chapter 5, he's saying you have to give them double honor. He's saying, so also like for believer bosses, you have to work more than you work for, uh, you know, a, a, a boss in the uh, in the world. Okay, so he says that, you know, um, uh, give them greater honor. Um, don't take advantage of them. Um, and you know work more for them work much harder for them uh, and don't take advantage because that he's a believer he will grant you favor he will lessen your workload and he will favor you above the rest of the employees that's a wrong thing to uh, you know wrong way of thinking and um, you also need to uh, work sincerely even if it's a believer boss and then it says let them not despise them because they are brethren but rather serve them Okay, so you have to serve those who are even believer bosses. Okay, and uh, here he's saying that, uh, you know, he's talking about a born servant. Um, and just imagine if a slave 
you know, uh, Tess is saying, my master is my brother and we are equal before the Lord and he has no right to tell me what to do. Okay. Well, that is so totally wrong. Uh, so it's equal to that. If we as uh, believers are going to say that, you know, my master or my boss is a brother in Christ uh, and we both are equal before the Lord because for God, there is no Jew nor Greek, male nor female, all are one. Then he has no right to tell me what to do. That's totally wrong. Okay, so we have, um, and when we do that, we are actually dishonoring God and that's not pleasing in God's sight. So even as Paul is writing this to Timothy, he's telling him, please teach these things to uh, the people in church, you know, exhort them, teach them uh, these things, teach them how they should, uh, their responsibilities at home, responsibility to this, their families, responsibility towards the widows, how they have to honor father, mother, brother, sister, uh, widows, how they have to honor elders and how they also have to honor their bosses and how they have to behave in the workplace. And he says, please teach them and exhort all of these things. So uh, if you are pastors, we also are supposed to be teaching and preaching these things. Uh, or if you're doing a Bible study, you can go ahead and preach and teach how people should conduct themselves at home and at the workplace. And each one of us, even as we have God has placed people above us, you know, we need to walk in uh, submission, in obedience, and uh, give them respect and not take advantage of them. Okay, then we'll move on to the second section that is words of truth verses three to five. Can somebody read that, please? If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, unless useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Thank you, Dave. So here, um, Paul is saying that we must teach, we must address uh, matters about how to relate uh, to widows, to extended families that he mentions in chapters 3 and 5, which have, and uh, the workplace relationship. And he says when we teach these things, we are actually teaching wholesome words. That means we're teaching words of truth or we're teaching truthful words. And uh, this teaching is aligned to godliness. So it's so important to teach these things because when we do, we're teaching them the words of truth, truthful words, and these teachings are aligned to godliness. If we don't teach such things, uh, then Paul is telling Timothy that, you know, we will simply be engaging uh, in mere arguments. Uh, and he's saying, don't engage in arguments, uh, which are just mere words, because these arguments uh, come out of people who are corrupt minded, whose uh, minds are decayed, whose uh, are rotten, they don't have the truth. Um, okay, so corrupt means rotten and decayed. Uh, so corrupt minds and they are devoid of truth. That means they're totally away from the truth. So there's no point in arguing with them, uh, you know, uh, but you just preach and teach what is the wholesome truth. And he says such people who bring in wrong teachings, false teachings, uh, you know, corrupt teachings whose minds are corrupt, uh, such people think that godliness is a means for making money. Okay, and so Paul is saying, stay away from such people. Now, there were uh, these elders in the church, uh, Jewish elders, uh, who are bringing about all these wrong teachings, and they were doing it so that uh, in a form of godliness to deceive the people, but they're doing it to make money. And hence, Paul is saying, you know, don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep away from such people because such people uh, think that godliness is a way of uh, means of making uh, money. So he's telling Timothy, don't use godliness, don't use your walk of faith as a means of making money for your 
self. Okay, so when we see people um, using matters of faith, of church, ministry, the kingdom of God, uh, to whip, uh, and to make money, we need to keep away from such people. And so Paul is saying, withdraw from these people. Sorry. So Paul is saying, stay away from these people, withdraw for them, uh, because they're using their godly, godliness uh, for a way to make um, money. Now, what Paul is not saying here is, you know, that uh, uh, if you're godly, you shouldn't be making money. No, that's not what he's saying. Uh, you know, you can be godly and have money. There's nothing wrong with that. You can be godly and make money. There's nothing wrong with that. But what Paul is really trying to say here is, you know, don't use uh, your godliness. Uh, don't use the church. Don't use your faith. Don't use uh, the kingdom of God uh, to, as a means to make money. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's it's sad that some pastors manipulate people, um, you know, to get money, to um, uh, rob the rich, you know, or make use of them or take advantage of them. That's very wrong. Um, so we can't uh, use our godliness, our faith to make money. But there's nothing wrong in, you know, being godly and working hard and earning a good sum of money. Or it's uh, nothing wrong in being godly and making money in the right way, um, which honors God and uh, is not wrong. Okay, so that is what he's saying in uh, these uh, in these verses, and he's saying, you know, stay away from such people, Timothy. Don't have anything to do with them. And then he got, goes on to talk about in the next section, verses six to ten, that God about godliness with contentment. So can somebody read verses six to ten, please? But godliness with contentment is great grain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kind of evil. So people eager of money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Okay, thank you. So Paul is saying now godliness. Um, so Paul has just told Timothy that those who misuse God's word wrongly uh, think that godliness is a means of material gain. Um, uh, and Paul knows that his statement will be understood, so he follows it up with an explanation. And he says, uh, now godliness with contentment is uh, great gain. Uh, it's true that godliness is great gain, but only when it is accompanied with contentment. Okay. Um, a very important scripture here uh, that Paul is mentioning on how we need to live our lives. We need to live our lives with godliness and with contentment, because when we do that, it is great wealth. What is contentment? Contentment is basically being satisfied uh, with what we have, uh, you know, just being happy uh, with what you have, it does not mean that you should not, uh, you know, uh, work hard uh, uh, to get, you know, a better position, a better pay salary, a better hike. It does not mean that you need to get better uh, with the, the kind of person you are, uh, okay, but it does not mean all of these things. Yes, you need to get better, you need to work harder so that you get promoted. Uh, uh, the job where you are working, you can get a good uh, uh, increment, a good pay hike. Uh, if you're running a business, you know, uh, you will want to work harder to see your business making uh, profit. Uh, but Paul here is not talking about all of these things that, you know, you just be content uh, with what you have. That means, you know, just be content where you are in your position. Uh, just keep doing the same things. No, uh, we need to improvise. We need to uh, work hard. Uh, we need to bring in uh, more um, excellency, more ideas in the place where uh, we are working. What Paul is basically talking about here is about the heart issues, the attitudes. He's saying that, you know, we need to live 
with godliness and we need to live with contentment. That means we need to be grateful for what we have. Uh, we need to stop comparing us, ourselves with others, stop competing ourselves with others in terms of material positions, with, uh, in terms of what they have, their talents, what they're good at. Um, you know, so stop uh, comparing yourself with others, the, basically with their material possessions, stop competing with others. Uh, you know, if we don't do it, we will never be happy. We will always feel discontent because there's always somebody who's better than us. There's always somebody having a bigger car, a bigger home, a bigger this, a bigger that, doing things better than us. Uh, so, you know, we will never be content. So stop comparing and stop competing with others. Uh, yes, you can always look at others and say, wow, you know, when they were able to do it, I too can do it. Um, you know, there's nothing that's going to be difficult or impossible. It's going to challenge you, strengthen you to move forward, to work harder, to do, be the best at where you are. Okay. Um, and, but don't compare and compete in the wrong sense because it will constantly make you feel discontent. Uh, You'll always be happy. No matter how much you have, you will always be wanting more and more and more because there's always somebody who's having more than you. There's somebody who's always better than you. And, uh, you know, who better uh, to write this to Timothy than Paul himself uh, when, you know, Paul is writing in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, uh, where he says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. So Paul is the right person to write this because, you know, he's gone through times when he was hungry, he was beaten up, he was shipwrecked, he was left um, almost dead. Uh, he had, um, you know, plenty of times, times he had nothing. And he's saying that, you know, whatever the situation was I always learned to be content I, or I was always content in whatever state I was in plenty or when he lacked something he learned always to be content he learned always to be satisfied and we see that you know Paul never lost his inner peace and joy his inner peace and joy his contentment and satisfaction uh, that did not depend on his outward circumstances Okay, it was because his peace and joy were directly connected to his relationship with God and not to this outward circumstances. And that is why in this context, he was able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so he's telling Timothy that, you know, he wants Timothy to teach uh, the believers in the church about these things. Okay, and then... Uh, moves on to in verses 9 and 10 where he says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and to many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and prediction. And then he says in verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For some people have strayed away from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay. So there's nothing wrong to be rich. Uh, you know, we read from scripture that God himself brings abundance into our lives. Uh, God gives prosperity, wealth, riches, honor, blessings. God gives uh, richly all things for us to enjoy. Uh, you know, God seeks to put wealth of the world into the hands of his people. And God does that. Okay? He loves to do it. He does that for his people. And uh, But God wants to make sure that we have the right ha heart capacity to handle what he gives us, okay? Um, so what is the right, uh, 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 right heart attitude or the right heart capacity that God is looking for? Uh, it's not that, you know, we have this attitude and say, God, you've blessed me with all this. This is for me, okay? Okay. Uh, Let's not be like the rich uh, fool 
who built bigger barns to store all of his riches, but he was so poor in giving or blessing people who worked for him. So don't keep everything for yourself. Uh, see yourself as a, we need to see ourselves as a good steward of everything that God has put into our hands. Uh, God has blessed us abundantly. Uh, you know, he's given us all that we need. Uh, he's given us sometimes more than what we have need. Uh, uh, and he's done that for a reason. And Paul later on tells us uh, in this chapter, uh, you know, he writes later on what we need to do with the riches with which God has blessed us with. So here we're basically seeing that we need to keep our hearts free from the love of money, the desire for riches, keeping it all for ourselves, holding it for all for ourselves, keeping ourselves free from the love of money. Um, if we don't have, uh, you know, the right kind of heart attitude, then Paul is saying that we come in a place of danger. Okay, if you have a heart attitude where we're saying all is for I, me, myself, uh, you know, and we, we become uh, desiring for more of riches, more for money, all just for ourselves, then, you know, Paul is saying we're in a place of danger. And the place of danger that we are in is a place where it will lead us into many temptations, snares. That means, um, you know, the, the evil one is trying to trap us, uh, to catch us, uh, to destroy our lives. Uh, we will also get into many uh, lustful passions that will uh, hurt us, uh, will bring misery and pain and hurt us, and it will draw us away from God, okay? It will draw us away from our faith. It will draw us away from the relationship with God. And why is Paul mentioning this here and writing it to Timothy? Is because this is what is happening in the church at Ephesus, okay? Um, uh, the leaders, you know, who are, uh, you know, being godly, but they're trying to uh, preach and teach false doctrines, doing it all for, uh, to make more money. It's not only happening at the around. Uh, it's also something that we see very prevalent in uh, to churches today. So, you know, we need to take heed. We need to learn. Uh, you know, it's easy for us to say, okay, this pastor does this, that pastor does it, but we need to guard our faith. We need to guard what is entrusted to us. That is what Paul goes on to tell Timothy. Okay, so it's easy to look at others and uh, you'd say, okay, they have fallen, they made a mistake, but we need to ourselves guard, be careful in those areas. And so even as we're learning this, we can say, okay, I'm not rich or I'm not, uh, you know, uh, going to get rich or, you know, uh, I'm so I'm not going to fall into all of these temptations, um, you know, uh, or I am somebody who constantly gives others. It's a good thing, but uh, we need to guard ourselves because we never know when we are going to fall. Okay, and then he moves on to talk about uh, the next section, the life of a man of God, verses 11 to 16. So can somebody read verses 11 to 16, please? Eleven to sixteen. But you O men of God, fill these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gen gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed. The God confession in the presence of many witnesses. I argue you, I argue you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilots that you keep this commandment without sport, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest his own uh, his own time, he who is the blessed and only patent pot Potent, the King of Kings and the Lords of a uh, Lord of Lords, who alone has immorality dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. 
Thank you, Prince. So in the view of uh, the potential dangers and how some people abuse the faith for making their own personal gain, Paul is here admonishing Timothy to flee away. That means to run away uh, speedily, quickly, away from such things, uh, stay away from such uh, uh, people uh, who love money, who use godliness as a means to make money uh, and, uh, you know, stay away from using himself, using godliness as a means for gain. And then he's telling Timothy what he needs to focus on, saying, so you focus on things such as righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. And then he says, fight the good fight of faith, keeping a firm grip on what is eternal, okay? So uh, here we see it's so important for us as believers, as ministers of God, uh, to guard ourselves from the love of money and from all such things that will draw us away from God and from our faith. And Paul says, fight the good fight of faith, which means he's saying, you know, Timothy, there is an enemy, he's real, and he's not going to be easy. It's not going to be an easy walk. Um, uh, and because there is an enemy, you need to make a choice to fight the good fight of faith. You need to make a choice to take hold of the eternal life. Uh, you need to hold on to your good confession, uh, which you have pro uh, professed in the presence of many uh, witness. So, and then he goes on to remind Timothy about Jesus. Uh, and he's talking about this instance when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus does not change his confession. He did not uh, quit uh, from doing what he came to do. He went through moments of intense pressure and pain and suffering and agony. And um, he held on to his uh, stand to the truth to and he did what he came to do and so uh, Paul is telling Timothy follow the example of uh, Jesus and he's saying also follow the example of Jesus because the same Jesus is coming back uh, and he says you know he he says that this Jesus who's coming back uh, is the king of kings the lord of lords who alone has immortality, he dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has can has seen or can see. Okay, so he's saying this Jesus is going to come back. And so, Timothy, uh, you and all the believers have to live a godly life because you are going to meet this king who is the king of kings, the lord of lords, who is immortal, uh, who uh, lives in unapproachable light, but we are going to see this great, awesome, and mighty king, okay? Um, and so, you know, the uh, for us as well, you know, we need to um, live our lives, uh, not quit, uh, not given to pressure, not given to doing things to please our masters when they tell us to do things that are wrong, to say things that are wrong, uh, to live standards that are wrong, you know, we don't compromise, but we take our stand boldly uh, and uh, we do what is right in God's sight because we know that uh, Jesus himself set us an example and this king of kings is coming back and we have to meet this king. And if we have to meet this king and live with this king, then we need to live holy lives, pleasing and acceptable in his uh, sight. And then uh Paul goes on to say, in view of all this, what should be our response or what should be the responsibility of the rich? So if God has blessed you with uh, riches, blessings, we're talk not talking about riches in being a millionaire or multimillionaire or billionaire. Uh, if he's just blessed you more than what you basically need or what you basically use, then you are rich. Then he's... Uh, he goes on to uh, give us uh, what is the responsibility of the rich or what should be the response of the rich in verses 17 to 19. Because, uh, can somebody read verses 17 to 19, please? Can I read? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kanan. Uh, 
recommend those who are uh, rich in this present age not to be um haughty haughty uh, not to trust in uncertain riches but uh, in the living god who gives us richly all things to enjoy let them do good then uh, that they be rich in good works ready to give willing to share storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life okay yeah. thank you so here it was 17 it says uh, you know those who are rich should not be haughty means uh, let them not get proud because all that they have is god's blessing and god has blessed us with riches or uh, given us abundantly not because we are good or uh, not because um, we are more spiritual than the others or not because of our faith or our good deeds no uh, we shouldn't think that god is blessing us because of our goodness our faith our good deeds or how spiritual we are you know god is blessing us because that is who he is uh, he desires to bless his people uh, instead we need to not have a proud attitude but we need to be stewards uh, of what god has entrusted us with or um, you know uh, uh, what god has given to us and paul is saying don't put your trust in money but put your trust in god so what should uh, people who are rich or those who are blessed by the lord do uh, he says do good be rich in good works be ready to give willing to share bless others with god god has blessed you it's basically saying be a generous person give give to the church give to the needy give to the poor give to those who are around you who are suffering struggling give to uh, family members who have a need uh, give uh, be generous um, and he says when you are doing that you know when you are a generous person there is something that is happening on your behalf in eternity and he mentions about this uh, also in philippians chapter 4 verses 5 to 19 where paul is uh, writing to the philippians and he informs the philippians uh, that what they have given to him is a sweet smelling offering before god now the philippian the church at philippi has collected of offerings sent uh, Paul that so he's saying whatever you have done or given me is like a sweet smelling offering before God and he says that fruit will be credited to their account and God himself will provide for all their needs okay so likewise you know when we are generous when you are giving for the work of God's kingdom there's fruit abounding uh, in your account we do not know what kind of account God is having for us in heaven okay we don't know about that but there's something that's happening in eternity on your behalf okay and also we see here uh, uh, we read here that when we give it's a sweet smelling aroma before God so our giving is also like worship to God god is pleased with it um you know as you give god will supply all your needs okay because god jesus says give and it will be given to you a good measure pressed down shaken uh you know full and overflowing will be uh, poured into your lap the the amount you give that will you will receive okay so Uh, the reason you can give is because you know god will again fill you up or supply all that you need uh, because um, you know that god is the source so he is the one who supplies you will never run out you will never run dry uh, so don't be afraid to bless others don't be afraid to give to others uh, your eyes should not be on your money your eyes should be on the lord who is your source who is your giver who will bless you and who is the one who will totally uh, support you so here is talking about giving or blessing others uh, you know uh, just giving through your uh, riches with what god has blessed you with okay we just have one minute before the break we'll stop here um, if anyone has any questions any doubts before we look at the other verses no questions no doubts okay if not we'll go for a break and then we'll come back after the break okay <laughs> 